April 25th, 1969, I was in the lead helicopter that was shot down on the east side of the Ashaw Valley on Dong Nagai. Maybe seconds after I was shot down, I saw Captain David Watson, who was one of the pilots, and uh, Spec 4 Thomas St. Ange, one of the other RTOs, run up the hill. And I watched as both of them were killed by the same RPG. Tom was my friend and a fellow RTO, but there was no time to think about what had happened. We only had five men on the ground that could fight, and we were left there for 45 minutes before the choppers started coming in. Two more of them were shot down. I didn't think it could get any worse than it was, but it did. The only guy became Firebase Airborne, which was overrun later while we were on Hamburger Hill. My name is Gerald Robert Harkins. Uh, most people call me Bob Harkins. From January of 1969 until August of 1969, I was a company commander for Company A, 3rd Battalion, 187th Infantry Regiment, Airborne. Uh, I took command on Firebase Rakasan at the same time that uh, Colonel Weld, Lieutenant Colonel Weldon Honeycutt took command of the battalion and Lee Sanders took command of Delta Company. I got off of Firebase Rakasan and during the about the 15th of January. And between the January and March, uh, we tried to fulfill a mission that was given to us by uh, by uh, Colonel Honeycutt and then also uh, uh, Division. And it kind of stems back to why we wanted to go into the valley. The Aishal Valley had been a large staging area for Tet 68, and the intent from the division commander on down was to deny the, the valley access to the NVA for resupply and for mustering the troops for attack on the city of Way and other, other cities uh, down through the northern part of i -Corps. And in my two years in Vietnam is the only time I got a written operations order, the operations order to go into Hill 937, Dong At Bia, or later became known as Hamburger Hill. From Dong the Guy, we were choppered into Camp Evans for a one-day stand down. The talk going around was that we would be heading back to the Aishaw Valley on the western side of the Laotian border, which we knew was a very bad place. The next day, we flew into Firebase Blaze, and we tried to rest and relax, but there was undeniable unsettled feeling among us. Firebase Blaze was a real beehive of activity with choppers, cranes, gunships, people everywhere, and we were told they were going to bring in medical personnel, hospital tents as well, to be closer to us. They had never done that before. And that ramped up the anxiety level, and, and we talked about it and what was awaiting for us across the Ashaw Valley. There were, LZ was cold when we landed, so I gathered my company and moved to the river. We set up three ambush zones uh, along the river to cut off any reinforcements that may be coming into the hill from the, river, from the Laotian side of, that, of the, the border. We were there... Uh, on those days, uh, the 10th and finally on the 12th, I was moved back to the battalion CP and Delta Company was released to make a, an assault up the hill on the left-hand flank. Delta Company got into contact. Uh, they ended up having a helicopter crash down, a medevac helicopter crash down on uh, their company. Uh, and uh, my second platoon, or the third platoon, excuse me, 
uh, Dan Bresnahan went down to help them carry the bodies of the wounded up on the 13th and 14th. The 15th, we made the assault on the hill uh, with Bravo Company. I took over the ridge that Charlie Company should have been on. I'm not certain they were really on the ridge that I was on, but I was on a ridge that was coming in, if you're looking at you know, kind of a bowl, I was coming in from the, uh, the, the far right-hand flank and then curving into the, 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 the peaks of Dong Abia. Uh, we were making progress. We had put enough uh, air and artillery in on the, 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 the hill. There had been several assaults by B Company and C Company, uh, and the one by D Company that didn't materialize in an attack on the hill, but still a lot of air and uh, artillery support uh, was fired in support of our operations. As we were breaking out of the tree line into kind of the bombed out area, which was a kind of a, the forest had been de, denuded, if you will, and there was just a lot of splinters and limbs and tree trunks and everything like that. Uh, they still had claymores in the trees. They had uh, cross fields of machine guns. Uh, they were in the A-frame bunkers. Uh, so what we would do is move forward, gain contact, once we had gained contact, bring forward a 90 millimeter recoilless rifle, try and blow up a bunker, and then go in and seal that trench line and move on to the next. As we were making what I thought was pretty good progress on the 15th, uh, or the, the company assault, the A company and B company assault on the hill, a gunship came out of nowhere and dumped into Bravo Company's command post. At that point in time, uh, and understandably so, they basically stopped firing and fighting and started getting into a survival mode because most of their leadership had been taken out. When that happened, the bad guys then turned the full force on to me, uh, to my company, and uh, we, we tried to stabilize and, and make certain that we could pull back if we needed to pull back. Uh, Honeycutt wanted me to make certain that I covered Bravo Company's withdrawal. Uh, we did that. We came back down and linked up with Bravo Company uh, that night. Uh, the 16th and 17th, we blew the, the crap out of the top of the hill, again, with a lot of air and artillery, even naval gunfire. Uh, the 18th, B Company, or correction, A Company and D Company made the assault on the hill. I, I took the same ridge that I was on before and Delta Company kind of came up through the middle where Bravo Company uh, in, had been before. There was an awful lot of uh, 51 caliber firing on the left, hand, uh, yeah, the left hand flank of Delta Company, resulting in a lot of casualties to include the company commander and many and most of the senior leadership. Uh, that's the day that it started raining. And as we attacked this, uh, this hill, uh, the many of our fire support bases that were firing artillery and mortars in support of us were more rocketed and mortared themselves. And when that happens, they go into counter mat, counter battery, counter uh, uh, fire uh, to protect themselves against uh, incoming rockets and mortars. So when it started to rain, and it rained hard, it, it rained hard, hard, hard. Uh, and it was just a big mud bowl. Uh, you'd take a, a step forward and slide down four foot and take another crawl up the hill. There wasn't a lot to grab onto. Most of the vegetation was gone by this time. Uh, and we lost the support of all of our helicopters uh, because of weather. The only thing we had was two uh, Vietnamese Air Force A1Es that were flying for us and they flew as long as they could. Uh, I ran out of people to try and push forward Honeycutt didn't have more people to put in behind me, so he told me to hold tight and uh, asked me if I could dig in. And I said, there's no way I can dig in and hold where I'm at. Uh, I'm in too deep, and I need to get myself, be able to extract myself back out of here. We covered Delta Company's withdrawal and then uh, linked up that night. And then it was on the 20th when we all went north uh, or went up the hill. And by then, we had had additional companies uh, 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 attached to the battalion. Two, two Arvin battalions were attached uh, in the, uh, to the battalion in, in the fight. Uh, 
every time I did an assault on the hill, I was promised by General or Colonel Honeycutt that the first of the 06 was going to come riding in on my right flank and we would be able to use them to press and get to the top of the hill. I could hear the 51 calibers that they were dealing with. They had their own problems. There was no way they were going to get to, get to be where I could uh, get any help from them. On the 20th, um, about 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, Honeycutt and I were arguing, having a company commander, the battalion commander, discussion over the radio. Uh, he kept telling me, I can see them, they're up and moving, you know, get moving up the hill. Well, we were moving up the hill as best we could, and I got kind of ticked off at the blackjack, and I threw the radio back down, came out of a bomb crater and got grazed in the ear in uh, part of my neck. Uh, and it, it it somehow took away my my hearing and my sight and my left eye. I couldn't see for a while. Uh, I couldn't hear for a while. So I was I was holding on to one person as we were going up the hill, and it made a pretty significant target. And once I was pretty comfortable that we had the hill, uh, I turned the company over to Gordy Atchison, the second platoon leader, and uh, w worked my way back down to get medevaced. On May 10th, 1969, Bravo Company was being held as a reserve force. And that morning, we watched multitudes of choppers take off with troops and come back. There was more helicopters than I'd ever seen, and there were five battalions of men and over 100 Hueys, not to mention the gunships guarding them. It was really an awesome sight. We sat there and watched it all day. We began to realize something larger and worse than we had imagined was about to become reality. Hughes inserted us that afternoon into the same LZ the rest of the battalion had landed on. Our first contact came not long after we were on the ground. Bravo's objective was to get as close to Hill 937 as we could, but the NVA attacked Lieutenant Eward's second platoon. The lead platoon with RPGs, AK-47s and machine gun, but the F-105s brought an end to their attack. Next day, Bravo 1st Platoon was the lead platoon. We crawled through the bent bamboo and jungle vegetation caused by the F-105 attack to get some NVA soldiers killed the day before. Lieutenant Frank Bacha, Phil Nelson, Doc Muldoon, and I checked the bodies for any information they might have. As I looked at the small, young, dead NVA soldiers, I started feeling bad that they had been killed. Here in the jungle, and nobody knew about it, not even their families back home. I started to feel bad about it, but as I looked at them, I began to think, it is better that their mother, dad, girlfriend, or wife, or family cry for them than my mother, my dad, my wife, or my family. Later on, I learned that Lieutenant Botcher felt the same way as I did. We got to the place where we dehumanized the enemy by calling him Charlie and Gook, and sometimes some profane names that seemed to make it a little easier to deal with them and their destruction. We headed out following debris and a blood trail going in the direction of Hill 937. We knew they were leading us into an ambush, but they were going exactly where we were ordered to go. We were supposed to go up on, be up on top of Hill 937 by 1,400 hours. And Captain Chuck Litton and our Bravo Company CO told us to take a break, but later came back on, and Blackjack, uh, then Lieutenant Colonel Weldon Honeycutt, wanted us to move out. And as I stood up, my rucksack strap broke and fell to the ground with my radio in it. And as I was trying to prepare it, Captain Littman said Lieutenant Chuck Denholm's 4th Platoon would take the lead. They proceeded with caution as we did, knowing that they were being led into an ambush as well. After going farther up the trail, we came to the ambush. And there was a smash of RPGs. Claymores, AK-47s, 
small machine guns, and then we heard the unmistakable sound of a 51 caliber machine gun. There was yelling and screaming, men moving up and down the trail, some to reinforce the 4th platoon and bring back the dead and wounded, some to carry ammo. We knew this was not a firefight, but well-entrenched soldiers ready to fight us. We were on a trail of a razorback ridge surrounded by thick jungle vegetation which prevented maneuvering on the flanks, except up and down the trail is the only way we could go, and darkness was drawing near. Later we realized the NVA were in spider holes, fortified bunkers, and even in high treetops. That night was a very restless night. We began to wonder about what kind of place this was and why they were defending it. Over the course of the battle, we made a number of assaults up the hill and we would come back down each time because we had limited space to move in and it seemed as if all of their weapons were trained in on the clearing and we just couldn't seem to get past that. At that point in the battle, our line of sight to the enemy positions was limited by the jungle vegetation. I remember one time they let us get past the clearing and uh, that was the time Lieutenant Botcher and I got pinned down on opposite sides of the trail and their 51 caliber machine gun was tearing up the trees each of us was behind. It was fortunate that we were on the back side of the trees on the down slope, which I think is what saved us from the 51 caliber. Lieutenant Botcher brought the 90 millimeter recoilless rifle up and Nelson and Clifton fired it towards the area of the 51 caliber. But as they fired, an RPG hit close by and they came tumbling down the hill. I think every assault was a somewhat different scene, but had to have the same outcome. It just depended on where they wanted to hit us when we first came into the clearing or got past the clearing. The noise level also was so unbearable, and when you get hit, it seems like a lot of confusion. But everybody's trying to do what they're trained to do and also looking out for the ones on our right and left. The assault or the attempted assault on the 14th is the one I probably remember most. Fast movers were supposed to come in and drop bombs and under the cover of the bombs, we were supposed to rush the bunker line. The bombs were supposed to drop in the valley between us and Charlie Company. And I don't know if it landed too far up or too far down but debris and shrapnel came flying up and hit our assistant machine gunner, Miles Westman. Miles was younger than most of us and without a doubt the best moral and likable man in our platoon. His death affected us more than anybody else's death, and it being a freak accident, we couldn't do a thing about it. Another part that bothered me was being hit by our own ARA. The company CP was hit and Captain Littman was taken out with most of the CP, and that broke our back that day. The battle was bad enough, but having our own gunship fire us up was a hard pill for us to swallow. It was very demoralizing. The battle to me was down in the dirt, mud and blood, hard, tough, cruel, scary. Dong Atbia was where we were supposed to go because we were supposed to find the enemy, engage them, and destroy them. That's what we did. After all these years, I see pictures of it in my mind every day. I can recall sounds, voices, smells, faces. think about the battle, it's the 50th anniversary. Uh, a lot of brave soldiers did a lot of brave things. And uh, I think there's a lot to be proud of that the 3rd Battalion, 187th, fought hard and took the hill. Thank you. But we come to Fort Campbell every year for the Hamburger Hill chapter reunions and remember those that we lost in battle and all those who survived. That's a very important time for me and I think for most men. 
we come here and have a good time. We enjoy being with each other. We talk about those good men we lost who died in the battle, those who were wounded and left country, or some guys we just don't know what happened to them or where they are. But I will tell people about individuals I served with as long as I'm alive, and their memory will never be forgotten. A lot of good men died, a lot of good men were wounded. But the fact of the matter is, is we took out far more of the NVA soldiers than they took out of us. The Battle of Hamburger Hill, the Crouching Beast, Hill 937, whatever you want to call it, is a source of pride for me and all the other guys. Our battalion commander, then Lieutenant Colonel Weldon Honeycutt, could have taken us off the hill and had more troops, fresher troops, come in and finish the battle. But he said his battalion started the battle and we were going to finish it. And that's what we did. We finished it. We could have been known as the ones who couldn't take the hill, but we, the Rockasans, did take the hill. To me, that's a very big deal. We did what we were ordered to do. We did it in the best way that we could possibly do it. It's important to us because our Rockasan brothers fought, bled, and died on Hamburger Hill. But it's important to Rockasans who came before us and after us. It is maintaining the legacy and the, of the fighting spirit and standards of our predecessors and for those who follow us to build upon and continue to make Rockasans admired by our friends and feared by our foes. Rockasans.